Hello. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining me, Remo. Thank Is, you. Uh, are you enjoying the conference so far? It's tremendous to be here, right? Um, and, and I think I, I love the whole European aspect, right? I think there's enough people here to build some, some really large European companies, which I think is absolutely amazing. Great, good. Well, I'm looking forward to discussing your company, Lilium, yeah. which is a really exciting um, startup in, in Munich, um, in Germany, which is developing the world's first electric uh, vertical takeoff and landing uh, jet for commercial use. Uh, the company um, has already raised around $100 million uh, in venture capital and um, has done several pilot test flights with its electric takeoff jet. Uh, the jet is capable of 300 kilometers an hour. It is all electric, will be on demand, and ultimately could be autonomous as well. So Remo, tell us a bit about the company. What is the concept behind Lilium? Um, what are you trying to achieve? Fantastic. Well, thanks for the fantastic introduction. You said it all uh, spot on. But, but what are we trying to achieve? Right? At the end of the day, of course, we're building a totally new concept of, uh, of electric mobility and, and, and electric flying in urban populations. Right? So, so it is, uh, at the end of the day, an aircraft that takes off and lands and can fly 300 kilometers. But we're not stopping there. What we are really aiming to do is change how mobility works. Because as soon as you can do that, and it is electric, it is clean, uh, it is quiet, right? We, we can really start reimagining how do we travel, right? What does mobility actually mean, right? Um, if you can get close to people where they live and where they work, and we can uh, connect them in totally new ways, that is a paradigm shift, right? And, and throughout history, what we've seen, like as transportation gets faster, um, we, we end up traveling longer distances because we all are, are somewhat primed to, to a certain amount of time that we're willing to spend on, uh, on transportation. And, and obviously, we've seen that from the bicycle to, uh, to the cars to uh, as this evolution goes on, we ended up traveling further. And, and we believe that we, we are um, at the beginning of a similar transition uh, to do that. So, mm -hmm. and what we do, right? And how do we do that, right? Why are we at the Web Summit? Uh, of course, we are a, a hardware company at the end of the day, building an electric uh, um, jet, but we will create a service, right? We will create a service that's going to be easy to use. Uh, you, you book it on your mobile app, and, and it's going to be a very similar experience than, than what we've all gotten to use uh, with, with ride-hailing services. And, and that, I think, is going to be a tremendous and exciting journey to, to get on. Okay, so you envisage this being kind of uh, quite similar to the Uber service at the moment. People can get out their mobile phone and command an electric uh, jet that will just land in front of them and take them where they want to go? That's, that's pretty much uh, what we're thinking. Look, we, we are um, entering a phase where we're flying uh, really should start becoming part of our day-to-day. -day. So, so we, we are aiming for this to be affordable for everybody that sits here in the room. Uh, it, it should be uh, it will be, give or take, uh, a similar price point like an Uber or a Lyft mm -hmm. or, or, or a taxi, right? In fairness, at the beginning, I mean, that's not ultra cheap, but, but over time, of course, as well, as it goes autonomous, uh, the, the price points are going to change. But, but there's some, some very exciting um, change in, in terms of how the technology works, right? Uh, because you can do these distances, because it's electric, the electricity is pretty cheap. The operating costs are, are surprisingly low. So, so um, we often cite the, um, the example, the JFK in New York to, to downtown Manhattan which could become a five-minute flight and probably a price point around $40, $40, maybe $50, depends on the time of the day. And anybody who's done that journey before is like it can take anywhere between an hour and two hours and uh, usually costs about $65. So that's the type of, of paradigm shift that uh, we're talking about. Okay. Um, where are you with the technology at the moment? Um, yeah. What kind of pilot flights have you done and when do you expect it to be commercially available? Yeah. So, so we have, since 2017, the beginning, we, we have shown the, our two-seater aircraft, which was a, a technology prototype that uh, has done uh, some of the most critical things in, in terms of our evolution of showcasing um, the technology. Uh, part of that, of course, is, and it's very important to understand, right, it, it took off and then it started going into the forward flight motion. By the way, that is really what changes when you're, uh, rather than just hovering like a drone, when you start flying like an airplane. That's why we're talking about being able to do 300 kilometers and not 30 kilometers, because your energy consumption goes down by a factor of eight, a factor of 10, uh, give or take. So, so we've shown that right now, 
uh, we're working on the next version, which is the five-seater version, which will then uh, become the certifiable uh, aircraft. So, so there's a, a few more gates uh, to go. And certifiable basically means um, if we want to fly this uh, aircraft commercially, you do need to get the EASA, the FAAs of this world to, to then certify it as a, as a commercial aircraft. And that means they will set a safety bar that nobody probably in this room thought about when they took their, their, their Airbus A320 or whatever you took to get here. Um, you didn't really think about the safety, right? Because the safety bars are set by the regulators extremely high. Mm -hmm. And we will have to comply with a similar safety bar. So when do you expect to receive that certification? When would you like to? So it'll be a few more years. Um, what we believe is certainly by 2025, there will be a number, several different locations where this technology is going to be uh, part of the day-to-day -day mobility. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what that means is like there, there will be uh, tens, if not hundreds of jets in, a, in the city and, and people will be able to use it. So, so it'll have a meaningful contribution to, to how we're getting around. And mm -hmm. that's uh, by about 2025. Of course, working backwards, there's a bunch of stages and, and gates that we need to get through. Of course, one is the, the certification, which is a process, and we are in that process and already advancing on that process. But of course, it also has a, a bit of a an in that kind of uh, a badly defined endpoint in that in that way. But but mm -hmm. somewhere in, in in that gap, you can expect this to be part of your reality. Okay, so by 2025, you expect certification to be achieved and this technology to be available and launched on and locations. manufactured their crafts yeah. and and rolling them off uh, at a pretty sizable numbers of the of the factory okay great thanks and uh, what about competition in the space because i know that uber has got its elevate project which is mm -hmm. quite similar and i i think um some other aircraft manufacturers are also working on similar concepts um, is competition a good thing? Is there any collaboration? Yeah, look, the, the way we're looking at this is uh, we are actually seeing an entirely new industry being created here. So, so there's actually uh, over 100 different projects working on, on the actual aircrafts, and there's uh, thousands of different suppliers and other uh, companies that are starting to think, like, how do we um, support that ecosystem? So what we're talking about, we're talking about a, a world, we're estimating somewhere between 600,000 or to a million uh, aircraft uh, being uh, uh, sort of an early market size, right? And, and each aircraft having a, a revenue potential of a million to two million, you do the math, right? So, so we're talking to, about an industry that's bigger than a trillion dollars, right? Uh, some other estimates talk about an industry that could be in the order of 20 to 30% of today's automotive, like automotive industry, what, what we're doing on the ground today. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, we, we think it's great that there's competition and, and there's a, a whole ecosystem that is going to be needed. And we are not going to be the only ones to do this. And the more there is, the more um, cities are going to really think about well, what sort of infrastructure do we need to put in place? How do we actually accommodate um, all of that? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, how, how do you survive in, in, in a competitive environment? Of course, you've got to be very good at executing. Um, you've got to have good technology. You've got to build a great company. And, and these are sort of the, the hallmarks of any good, uh, good competitor. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. So it could be like a similar market um, build up as we've got with Uber and Lyft at the moment who are competing in the same kind of space. Yes, but, but you also have to do differentiate, right? Some people will just uh, remain platform providers, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and that is great. But then uh, there's many projects that actually build the aircraft, right? That mm -hmm. in itself is a, is a huge uh, adventure and venture, if you want. I mean, uh, for, for anybody here in this room that loves complexity, right? This is probably going to be one of the most complex, most exciting projects to, to be part of in terms of uh, building an entirely new um, type of aircraft that is, of course, going to be smart, that is going to, to link into airspace. We'll have mm -hmm. very interesting problems to solve around airspace management uh, to the point of like creating a, a great customer experience, right? Creating a, a journey, a user experience that, that is seamless. And some people will, will play on, the, um, on that uh, sort of platform, just uh, maybe facilitating the user experience and others will, will do a, a full end-to-end -end service uh, provision, right? Mm -hmm. so, and, and then within the people that create aircrafts, of course, there is a technologically quite fundamental difference. There's approaches that are more looking at uh, hovering aircraft, and, and then there's a group of people that, that follow the approach of transition aircrafts, right? And, and transition aircraft, that's where the physics play, is uh, as soon as you can start flying like a plane, as I said earlier, it's like then you use less energy and you can fly that much further. So, yeah. so there, there will be definitely different use cases and different markets for, for both of these types. Great, okay. Um, 
which cities um, and communities do you think this would be um, most easy to launch in first? Look, I think there's no community we don't think uh, should want that, right? And we are getting approached by um, from, from all around the world, which is phenomenal. And, and wherever we go, it's like people get it, right? This is for, if you put yourself in the shoes of a city or a state, this is a fundamental rethink of how you do infrastructure. Like for, for the first time, you can start creating a high-speed connectivity at a, probably about the thousands, if not the ten thousands of the cost um, of doing that. So what does that mean if you live um, in a very large um, urban area, that's usually the only time when you get access to high-speed connectivity, right? But, but if you live in a, in a town with 10,000, 20,000 people, nobody's ever going to build a, a motorway for you or, or a high-speed uh, rail link for you, right? And all of a sudden, uh, for, for these types of communities, you take half a million euros or, or less and you build yourself a pad and you get 360-degree connectivity um, for 300 kilometers at 300 kilometers per hour with, with our jet, of course. Um, that is a fundamental shift in, 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 in that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and larger cities have the problem is like adding more infrastructure is extremely expensive, right? You need to build, if you want to connect two points, right? You need to build everything in the middle, obviously, uh, and maintain that, right? All of a sudden you start thinking, actually, I only need to build A and B and actually the bit in the middle, I pretty much get for free because the air is there. And, and there's a tremendous amount of capacity in the air, right? There's a whole third dimension. These aircrafts can fly very slow so we can stack them uh, very closely together as well. So there's like a number of things that we can do. I mean, anybody who's seen the, uh, at the Olympics, like all of the, the, the kind of the small drones, how, how you can actually really do machine to machine uh, mm -hmm. connected uh, airspace management, right? There's yep. a ton of capacity in the air for, for us to, to utilize. Um, I think you mentioned to me before that um, Lillian's aircraft would fly at a lower altitude than most aircraft. So that would be one of the ways you'd get um, over the, the kind of complexity of uh, air traffic control? No, well, the, the altitude is going, to, uh, it's, it's going to be low altitude, but it's probably about 400 meters or above for most of the time. It depends a bit mm -hmm. how far you fly, but um, we don't think we're going to use this type of technology to fly two kilometers, right? It's not going to be a hop from one skyscraper to another. Uh, by the time, I think the changing cost and the, 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 the kind of opportunity cost to, to, to connect is just going to be too low. So, but if you fly for like 10 kilometers, you might go up to 500 meters uh, or, or more, right? If you fly for longer, we can go up to three kilometers in, in terms of altitude, uh, which afterwards you need pressurized cabins and other things. So um, okay. th there's quite a big space uh, that, ca that can be used. And, and this type of technology, you're not going to hear it on the ground, right? If, if you're flying at the sort of 500 meters altitude, there is no noise on the, on the ground. And as you're coming in, uh, you'll be more comparable to roll, roll noise uh, and kind of other um, types of noises that we anyways have in, in larger cities. Okay. Um, and how, um, how do you envisage the aircraft changing in terms of autonomy? Um, Will at first it have a pilot in the in the aircraft, and then as it develops over the years, it will become more autonomous? Yeah, so, so, so we're building a five-seater very much on purpose, right, so in order to have a pilot, because at that point, it means that the regulation exists, we can simply get it certified, um, and then work with the regulator on, on actual autonomous flight, right? It doesn't exist, but um, autonomy is a great one. So we just hired a fantastic guy, Mirko Reuters, who was running Audi's um, autonomous drive system, probably one of the most advanced uh, OEM in, in that space. Uh, and uh, what's fascinating is like it will be probably a similar pace as, as the automotive industry, but we will have uh, started much later. But also we have um, much fewer use cases to, to solve in the air than what you have to deal with on the ground, right? There's no hidden corners, no children running out into, into the street, right? So, so, so you have um, much larger visibility, you have longer times to, to react to, to these types of issues. So the autonomy in the air is gonna be much more what you call deterministic, right? We'll have a set of pretty clearly understood use cases. And that also means it's probably gonna be happening in parallel, if not faster, but of course, it's also regulatory. The regulatory hurdles are probably going to be higher. So, so it's not going to be super quick, but um, there's a bunch of challenges that can be totally uh, more easily solved. Okay. So in some ways, autonomous flight could develop faster even than autonomous road driving, potentially. It's possible, right. But mm -hmm. um, it's probably like, I think the car industry is making good progress. Um, 
might be about, roughly about the same time. We don't know. But, mm -hmm. but of course, the opportunity will be great, right, in terms of scaling up and then having uh, thousands of these aircrafts. If we don't need to hire pilots, that, that of course, is a tremendous advantage to then be able to fly autonomous. Mm -hmm. And um, what impact could this potentially have on infrastructure in general, um, on things like rail networks um, and, and on the roads? How could these electric vertical takeoff jets change, change that landscape? Look, we like to, to, to think in a connected way, right? where you already have great infrastructure, let's use it, let's connect it, let's connect it in different ways, where you already have a fast um, uh, rail line, why not connect all of the other places to that fast, fast line? But, but also there's a number of projects that might never have to be built, right? Well, one example uh, was just cancelled between uh, Singapore and, and, uh, and Kuala Lumpur, which happens to be a 300 kilometer distance, a $32 billion project that is never going to be done. Um, I think we could probably do it with a few hundred million um, in, in just pure investments and then of course building the aircraft to do that. So I, I think it creates totally new um, elements and the way we like to, to think about it, let's connect to what is already there, right? It's going to be a connected journey. It's not going to be, you're not going to fly from every single house to another house, right? So, so therefore mm -hmm. you need to connect these systems. So what would be a situation when somebody would opt to take a electric flight um, in a Lilium jet as opposed to get, get an Uber or drive their own car? So if you, for example, live in Richmond and you want to go to Manchester, you'd probably just take a Lilium jet, right? Because that'll be um, three times faster than, than any other way of, of doing it, mm -hmm. right? Uh, neither flying nor taking a car nor actually taking the train, right? And it's, it's going to be about the same price. Okay, great. So it could be faster, simpler, more enjoyable for around about the same cost. That's right. Great. And you've raised around $100 million so far in venture capital. Do you have any plans for um, rounds coming up soon? I knew you were going to ask me that question. <laughs> uh, um, no, look, of course we will continue to, to fundraise and, and this is a, a tremendous project. The, the, mm -hmm. the, the interest is there and then people obviously understand in terms of um, uh, going and really industri industrializing this and, and doing this at a large scale, we will not uh, kind of uh, be able to, to live on the 100 million. But, but the, the funding for now is there to, to really go for us to, to prove the technology and, 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 and show that. And uh, then future fundraise will certainly come. Excellent. Well, we look forward very much to seeing how Lilium develops. Thank you, Rima. Fantastic. Thank you, Thank you very much.